Welcome to church today. All you joining us online, welcome also. Recently, I become an American Ninja Warrior uh, fan. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Mainly, my wife got me involved with this thing, and uh, you you get to watch these various participants run through this obstacle course. And part of the the story, uh, the back uh, part of the show is the background story of all these various participants and all the things that they've overcome. And they they talk about overcoming all these obstacles and all this. And then frequently, what happens is that person gets on the obstacle obstacle course. Excuse me. <laughs> and they go out in the first obstacle. And I'm thinking, yeah, you overcome all this stuff, but you can't even do the rope swing, you know what I mean? And it's kind of anticlimactic, you know what I'm saying? I'm thinking, you know, at least get to the third obstacle. Now, I, I really admit, I couldn't get past the first obstacle, but this, the show really promotes this idea that you can be an overcomer, that you can overcome all things. Well, evidently, you can't overcome the first obstacle or two. Right, so so you can say all that you want, but what what I'm watching here is 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 well, I'd call it, you know failing on the obstacle course. Um, here's the self lie we have in our culture that we really have to watch out for. There's an idealized belief of being able to overcome anything through self reliance and self improvement. There's this idealized belief. You can overcome anything by self-reliance and self-improvement. And even the opposite of this, think of that you can't ever change who you are. It's still a declaration of focus on self. You're still focused on yourself. And th- there's this self-lie that just is so prevalent. And we're on week two now of winning the more war in your mind. And here's the rub I see. We're deeply influences people towards self-reliance and self-improvement. And there are a lot of athletes on American Ninja Warrior who are Christians, and they, they, they try to give that Christian message, but the story, may, uh, the, 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 the program majors on how contestants overcome through their uh, resilience, and their, you know, resilience of, uh, of the human spirit is constantly elevated to be the, the, this big thing, you know, but then like I said, they go on an obstacle one or two and becomes pretty anticlimactic. We cannot embrace, friends, that kind of philosophy and think, this is how I win the war in my mind through self-reliance and self-improvement. You can't do it. You cannot win the war in your mind by trying harder. You just get more frustrated. Um, When I was reading uh, Romans 7 here this last couple weeks, I thought that's a better description of what the results are when we we rely on ourselves than the American Ninja Warrior uh, background stories. You see, when we try really hard to overcome some things in our life, especially spiritually speaking, we kind of come to this conclusion, what a wretched person I really am. I just can't do anything really well. Um, But the good news is that through Jesus Christ, we can become overcomers. We can become thought warriors. We can win the battle of the mind. Your ways can be pleasing to God. Um, As Philippians 4 takes us through this little uh, you know, uh, sequence of thinking, you know, right thinking leads to right behavior, leads to right experience and experience the peace of God. That, that can really be a reality that we experience. I want to begin today by reading Romans 7. And I want us to listen to this with our hearts today, okay? And uh, I want to encourage you as I go through today's message, would you ask the Holy Spirit to really speak to you? Each one of us has particular things that we need to deal with here when it comes to our thought lives. Would you open yourself up to the moving of the Holy Spirit on your heart today and let him do some work in you and some transformation in you and make this a a holy moment. Let Let me read to you Romans 7 verses 15 through 24. Listen to this. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know what good uh, itself, I, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. 
Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Now hear this. Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave of God's law, but in my sinful nature a slave of the law of sin. See, Paul articulates here this mind struggle, this soul struggle that we go through. There's a war waging in us between evil and good. Just imagine if your thoughts right now could be projected on the screen behind me, okay? If we could see what you are really thinking and what's occupying your mind. Just, what, can you imagine that with me for a few moments? So, when it comes to some, some things in your life, say another person, would you be jealous of them? Or would you admire them and be happy for them when they succeed? What kind of thoughts would occupy your mind? Jealousy? Or admiration? Or how about this? Someone does you wrong. What occupies your mind? Revenge? (laughs) Pound for a pound of flesh? Or forgiveness? Sometimes you have to go through the process of getting from revenge to forgiveness. I understand that. But what tends to occupy you and occupy that space between your ears? Revenge or forgiveness? How about this one? Impurity or purity? Do you think pure thoughts? Do you see women as your sisters? Men as your brothers in the Lord? Do you put all other kind of context to the side and think pure thoughts? How do you do in this regard? If we were to project this, which side of the ledger would you tend to fall on here? If you're being uh, revealed here in the big LED screen behind me, would you be okay with what others saw? Paul says we have this war at work in us. Wrong thoughts like jealousy, revenge, and impurity, they can capture our minds. But what we want to capture our minds is the opposite. Admiration of others, you know, encouragement and exhortation. We want them to do well. We want to be people who are truly forgiving. We don't want to be slaves to bitterness and anger and hatred. We want to have pure thoughts, high thoughts, holy thoughts. We want to think those thoughts that Christ thinks rather than impurity. Initially, when I was putting together this this message, I forgot verse 25 in our Romans reading this morning. I just left it off. So I'm reading through the scripture a couple times, and it always ends with, what a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. And I thought, that's a terrible way to end. It's so discouraging. But it doesn't end that way, does it? It ends with a declaration that is so powerful that the thought warrior needs to think frequently. Thanks be to our God who delivers us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Right? That needs to occupy a thought warrior's Thinking, thanks be to our God. He delivers us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We need to say that frequently. We need to have that kind of occupy our minds. Here's a reality awareness. To become a thought warrior, you need power beyond yourself. To become a thought warrior, you need power beyond yourself. And Paul declares that this power is experienced by the deliverance of Jesus and through dependence on Jesus. By deliverance through Jesus and dependence on Jesus. Here's the power. Deliverance comes through Jesus Christ the Lord. In him, in him we have this divine power to demolish strongholds, to demolish arguments, and every pretension. Through Jesus you can take captive every thought to make it obedient to him. Now listen to Paul again here as he pens some other words uh, about the war in the mind over in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. Um, You need to know this scripture, and you need to memorize this scripture. You need to meditate on these kind of thoughts, okay? And here's what Paul says. For though we live in this world, we do not wage war as this world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Recently, um, I did a home sleep study. Anybody ever do one of those? My wife's been telling me for probably a decade or two that I need to do a sleep study, that something's wrong. And there have been times that she would nudge me awake, and I go, well, what? She said, breathe. 
I thought I was. No, you're not. You quit breathing and it scares me to death. You know, so breathe. So finally here lately, I've been feeling really cruddy and just like I'm in a fog all the time. And so I said, okay, I'll go ahead and do this sleep study. And now you can do it at home. You don't have to go in the little room and have all these people weirdly watching you all night long, right? You know, I don't like that kind of stuff. If you know me at all, I don't want, I, I want my privacy, right? So I'm taking this test at home and uh, I get the results back rel- relatively quickly and they say you have severe apnea. Not mild apnea, not just manageable apnea. You have a severe problem here and your oxygen levels are dipping below 80% at night. And so I go, oh, is that why I feel so foggy? Yeah, probably. So I get a CPAP machine. <laughs> oh, the first few days I used that machine, my wife would say, how did it go last night? And I would say, I felt like I wrestled a bear all night long. But I'm weirdly wide awake. Like, I am so wide awake right now. It's like toothpicks in the eyes, wide awake, you know? I am just like, ah! In fact, I'm a little giddy. I feel so good. And she says, that's because your brain is getting any oxygen. That's my wife, you know? She's helping me think this through. And, uh, and so uh, it was, uh, it was, even when I felt like I was getting used to the, the rhythm of this thing, it, I felt so much better. Now I feel really good. Better than I felt probably in the last 10, 10 to 15 years. And here's what I begin to realize. What I thought was normal wasn't normal at all. I was depleted. I was literally fighting for oxygen all night long. And the sad, sad thing about this is that this had gone on for years. And my wife had told me for years, you need to go see somebody about this. But you know what? I didn't want to admit I had a problem. And the last thing I wanted to do was put on one of those CPAP machines. I looked at them as Darth Vader machines, right? We got a Darth Vader. That's what, that is what I thought right there. I said, you know, I'm not going to breathe in that thing all night long. Be Darth Vader? Come on. You got to be kidding me. That, That somehow was an affront to my manliness. I don't know how else to say it. By the way, sleeping becomes something that you kind of have as a goal when you get old, I guess. I, this last week, I went to Cedar Falls and I watched my two grandsons run in a, in a cross-country meet and then I watched my other grandson play a flag football and I thought, oh, they're so young and athletic and so fit and they're looking so good and my goal right now is just to figure out how to sleep. Hmm. My, how goals change as you get older. I don't think about doing a triathlon. I think about sleeping five hours in a row. Anybody relate to me on that? Yeah, some of you, will, yeah, you, yeah, amen. It's, it's a sad, sad state. But just to give you an accurate picture, by the way, the seatback machine is super quiet. And my wife said, I can't even hear you sleep. I said, I know, I can hear you now. <laughs> so the tables have turned, huh? I said that to my doctor. She said, does she need to come in? I said, no, she's, she sleeps fine. So at um, any rate, listen, beloved, many of us are trying to live by our own strength and just trying harder to do life. I thought when it came to this whole breathing thing, I'll just try really hard. I'll just push my way through it. I'll just make it work. And it it led to this foggy existence, this substandard existence, this, this, you know, low oxygen thing at night and feeling really cruddy when I got up in the morning. And I think spiritually speaking, a lot of people are really tired. Are you tired? A lot of times we get to a series like this and everyone thinks, I'll just try, I, I need to think good thoughts. I'm going to try really hard to do that. And, but the, the problem is we have, you know, spirit apnea, I like to call it. We just, we lose connection with God. We're losing the oxygenation of the Holy Spirit. We're not, we're not connecting and, 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 and we're just, we're trying real hard. We're thinking, I'm just going to push through this and we're kind of having this foggy spiritual existence thing uh, going on. You ready to try something new? If it gets bad enough, you do. You get ready to try something new. Because without the divine power of Jesus Christ in your life, you can't do it. You can't take every thought captive. And some of us need to quit trying harder, and we need to start believing more. Do you hear what I just said? Some of us need to quit trying harder, quit being more self-reliant, quit thinking it's about self-improvement, We need to quit trying harder and we need to begin to believe more in the divine intervention and power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? 
there's such a different approach to life. It's not about trying harder in your Christianity. It's about believing more and being more dependent than ever on the Lord uh, Jesus Christ. Um, Paul declares this in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 21. Listen to this. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. You, friends, you, beloved, cannot take your thoughts captive yourself. You need the divine power of Christ in you to do that. You have to have a dependence on him to do that very thing. You need him to oxygenate your soul, to infuse you with the power that you don't have yourself. We're promised in Ephesians 1 that we can experience the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the grave. The same power is available to change the way we think. Do you believe that? That becomes the question. Do you believe that? Not do you try harder. Do you believe that God can change how you think? Do you truly believe that with all of your soul? Will you begin to go that direction in captivating the thoughts of your mind instead of just trying harder and being more self-reliant? I'm going to go a bit further than the book goes. We're, we have this companion book that's going along with this series, Winning the War in Your Mind by Greg Cushell. I'm going to go a little bit farther um, and talk to you about this power of being uh, the person of the Holy Spirit this morning. Um, as the church age began, we read in Acts chapter 1 how Jesus told the disciples in verse 8 that they were to uh, wait where they are until they receive power from on high. And then we get to Acts chapter 2, and the disciples are together in one place, and the Holy Spirit comes upon their gathering. And we're told there, as they were celebrating the Feast of Pentecost, uh, we're told that the Holy Spirit came upon this group of disciples, and it manifests itself in, in flames of fire. The, the Spirit manifests in himself in flames of fire on the various disciples' heads, and they begin to have the ability to speak in in other languages, languages of other people that were there for the Feast of Pentecost, declaring the wonders and the works of God in the native tongues of these people. And there was this big pouring out of power uh, of the Holy Spirit uh, at, at, at the birth of basically the church. That, my friends, is the game changer, the Holy Spirit. You can't take thoughts captive without the power of the Holy Spirit being in your life, being real and being something that you experience. It's not about trying harder. It's not about improving more. It's about believing that there's a power available in Jesus Christ through the person of the Holy Spirit and that he will empower you to take your thoughts captive. Do you believe that? Some of you are nodding your heads yes. Because that's the only way you're really going to have success in this regard. The Holy Spirit will fill you with divine power to experience transformation in your life. And he will enable you to become truly a thought warrior and engage in the battle of winning the, the, the war in your mind. When I look back over my life, I marvel at God's intervention in it and his goodness to me. At a very young age, I experienced the overcoming power of the Holy Spirit. And I be, begin to realize really at a young age, this isn't about trying really hard. This is about abiding in God and about his Holy Spirit filling me and believing in it more and more and more. And whenever I feel like I wasn't doing really well, instead of trying harder, I'd say, I need to be more dependent on God. I need to cry out to God more to, to fill me with the person of the Holy Spirit. See, the religion I had experienced before I was really born again in a dramatic way was controlled and comfortable. How's that for saying it nicely? It was routine, and you did the same thing, and it was lifeless. It was a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof of it. And when I got born again, and when I asked the person, the Holy Spirit, to come right in me, it was a game changer. It just changed me so drastically. And so what was interesting was years later, when I felt called to become a pastor, I began to search for a denomination where they had a high value on transformation. They had a high value on conversion. They had a high value on the person of the Holy Spirit that had to be part of the doctrine of the church that I would pursue pastoring in. And what really attracted me to the Wesleyan Church, which is what we're part of, is its high regard, 
is her high regard for transformation. Jesus changes everything, amen? He changes everything. And the Holy Spirit fills the follower, enables him and her, uh, uh, you know, to become a new creation with a renewed mind, with new passions. This isn't just verbiage. This is supposed to be reality that we all experience. And I could not pastor in a church where this wasn't a core value. That's why I'm here in this church. That's why I love the Wesleyan Church. And this transformation, friends, includes a battle mind here. The battle of the mind, you know, in, 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 you know, the battleground of the mind. You can think differently. Hallelujah, right? Amen? Can you think differently? Amen? The Holy Spirit will empower you to think differently. Amen? I'm going to say this until I get some response. <laughs> Amen, right? Amen. We are a new creation in Jesus Christ with renewed minds. We are being made new. The Holy Spirit is empowering us to be more than conquerors today in this present life. Right now, you can begin this journey. Once you're born again, you're heaven bound. You're becoming a new creation. You are no longer of this earth. You are of heaven. And you might as well start living it now because you're going to spend an eternity living it. Amen? And so this whole nonsense about, well, we can't change in this life. It's in the life to come. You can tell where I'm coming from theologically here. I don't believe that at all. Jesus changes everything and the Holy Spirit makes it possible. Here's a question. Admitting you need a power you don't possess is vital. Will you admit this and ask God for this power? Will you ask for the infilling power of the Holy Spirit? I'm going to share uh, one of Greg Gushel's illustrations from his book, Winning the War in Your Mind. He said this, once after a blizzard. Anybody relate to that here? I tried to shovel a path to our cars <laughs> to get enough snow off our driveway to back them out. In two solid back-breaking hours, I had cleaned a pathway big enough for a small squirrel to walk through. Just as my wife was about to call 911 to save me from permanent frostbite damage, a neighbor from, from down the street drove by on his tractor. Yes, my neighbor drives a tractor. I live in Oklahoma. I think we could put South Dakota in there, too. Like... I know some guys who drive tractors around here. In a matter of minutes, because of the power he possessed, my helpful neighbor had cleared the entire driveway. We tend to fight our battles with shovel power, but we need to fight them with tractor power. We need a power that we don't possess. We have to ask for and receive help. Remember the popular definition of insanity? Keep doing the same thing, expecting different results. If you have tried, if you have tr uh, if you have tried with everything you have and it hasn't worked, stop. Don't keep doing the same thing. You'll get the same results. If you feel like you just have to admit defeat and stop trying, don't do that either because you'll keep living the same life. Don't give up. Look up. Look up because you have a gracious, generous God who has the power you need and wants to share it with you. To bring down your strongholds, it's time to go up. As a child of God, you have access to everything that belongs to your Heavenly Father. So look up, go up, and access, and access the power of God that you need to remove lies with and replace them with truth. Ask him to show you the lies you have believed for too long. Tell him you want your mind to be filled with this truth instead of the devil's falsehoods and then thank him for hearing you. And I would add this. Pray for the filling of the Holy Spirit to empower you. Listen to Luke chapter 11, verse 13. It says this. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So how do you get this? By trying hard? Or what do you do? You ask for it. You believe and you receive. You ask for it. This is a game changer. Lay down trying harder. Lay down self-reliance. And just say, I need you, Jesus. I need you. And I need your Holy Spirit in my life. And ask for that divine power, the same power that raised Christ from the dead is available to us to change the way we think. It was a short letter the visionary Sir John Templeton had included with his family Christmas card mailed out in 1962. Instead of using the letter to showcase his children's accomplishments or the family's annual vacation, anybody get those Christmas cards? Yeah. He took the occasion to encourage, yeah, I said it all when I said yeah. He took the occasion to encourage readers to think of the mind as a garden and themselves as responsible for tending that garden. He said this, if you exercise no control, it will become a weed patch and a source of shame 
and misery. If you exercise wise control, then it'll be filled with God's miracles and become a place of indescribable beauty. You're free to choose which. How can you do it? Simple. For example, develop the habit of looking at each thought as you would a plant. If it is worthy, if it fits the plan you desire for your mind, cultivate it. If not, replace it. How do you get it out of your mind? Simply by putting in its place two or three thoughts of love or worship. For no mind can dwell on more than two or three thoughts at one time. I think that's actually quite insightful. Part of the reason we do worship like we did this morning, and this was good stuff. The Psalm of Mind's a great song. What are we putting in our minds when we do that? Those things that are right, those things that are pure, those things that we ought to think on. What should they do? Replace those things that are not pure. We need to become people who practice replacement. We replace those things that are not fruitful, that are not good, and we cultivate that which is good. And then we pray to the Holy Spirit, come and do this in me, empower me to experience this, okay? He goes on to say this, circumstances outside the garden of your mind do not shape you, you shape them. For example, if you expect treachery, allowing these thoughts to dwell in your mind, you're, you're going to get treachery. If you fill your mind with thoughts of love, you'll give love and get it. If you think little of God, he'll be far from you. If you think often of God, the Holy Spirit will dwell more in you. The glory of the universe is open to every man. Some look and see, some look and see not. And his letter goes on, but you get the meat of it, okay? It reminds me of our serious goal. Think about what you think about. Don't just mindlessly go through life thinking that thoughts just come to you. Think about what you think about. Cultivate that which is, is good and that which is not rebuke it and stand in the power of the Holy Spirit and ask for his infilling so that you can actually do that battle. Henry Ford said this. Thinking is the hardest work there is, which is probably the reason why so few engage in it. Do you believe that? Thinking really is hard work. And normally we just do life mindlessly thinking. We just go along and the barrage of stuff comes our way. We're not filtering it. We're not thinking about what we're thinking about. Think about what you think about. Begin to cultivate that which is edifying and good. Reject that which is not. And ask for the Holy Spirit to empower you to do that very kind of thing. Here's a challenge. Will you declare war in the battleground of your mind? Will you declare war in the battleground of your mind? In her book, Operating Instructions, author Anne Lamont quotes this guy I know said. Here's what he said. My mind is a bad neighborhood that I try not to go into alone. Then she said, this is Anne, I feel this on a deep and spiritual level. Until these last few years, I never understood the importance of maintaining my mind or checking for the scripts I am believing or cutting out the lies. I had to wake up and realize I would have to fight for a healthier brain and that God joins me in this fight every day. Will you engage in the battle for your mind? So will you declare war in your mind on those things which are not of God? Will you be unwilling to settle for less than God's best for you? Will you declare, I'm not going to numb myself in this battle, but I'll fully engage in the battle of my mind? Will you declare, I'll be a thought warrior? Will you not settle for thinking that you're wrong? Thinking is normal and okay. It is not. It's anemic. It's life-taking. Your soul needs to be oxygenated. Will you quit being so distracted and so busy and take some time to face what's going on in your mind? Will you quit pretending and be honest about yourself, about wrong thinking? Are you cynical all the time? That, my friend, is not okay. Are you are you negative all the time? Are you always looking for the worst side of every story? That, my friend, is not okay. It's bad thinking. It's harmful for you. It's harmful for those around you. Where you quit thinking you're unlovable, that God doesn't care about you, that's not scriptural. He sees you. He knows you. He loves you so much. He what? Went to the cross. You, well, you, you got to quit wondering, does God love me or care for me? The cross answers that question. Of course he does. Where you quit thinking I'm helpless and hopeless because our God has not left us as orphans. He has not left us as orphans. He said, I go to the Father that you may have the person, the Holy Spirit, and he lives right inside you. God loves you from the inside out. The Holy Spirit lives in you, loving you from the inside out. You can't get any more intimate than that. There is no neutrality in this battle for the mind. There is no neutrality. You can't say, I'm not going to participate in it. By being human, you are a participant, whether you willingly engage or don't engage. You are in it because you're a human, and we serve a generous, powerful God who has shared with us the power to overcome. In the person of Jesus Christ, 
and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Declare war in the battleground of your mind. Change your thinking, friends. Change your life. Remember that? Change your thinking. Change your life. The exercise that we're going to do this week as we end here continues from last week. And uh, I want you to just participate with this to whatever degree you feel comfortable this morning. But write down the lies you believe, the big ones. What, what one, one or two things are you really believing today that it's just a lie? That you need to quit believing it. And you quit letting it define who you are and how you interact with others. Take these lies to God, admitting your need of the Holy Spirit's divine power in your life to tear these strongholds down and take your thoughts captive. And then what truths from the Bible can replace these kinds of lies? Think about what what does God really say? Am I believing that or am I believing a lie of this world? Let me give you a couple of examples. Sometimes we have a parent that we just can never please. I've talked to many people that way. I've experienced some of this myself. And that parent may even be dead for a decade or two, and you're still living to try to please them. Anybody relate to me on this? Here's what I'd say to you. Stop believing that lie. You have a heavenly father who loves you. He loves you just because you're you. You don't have to perform. You don't have to be something you're not. You just have to receive him and believe in him. And he loves you with an undying love. Relish that truth. Let that truth embrace your mind. Let that be what you think on that occupies you. Here's another one. I have to be a certain body size or have certain looks to be liked and be okay. The Lord looks at the heart, like Ryan was saying with our kids. When we raise our kids, we want to raise them from the heart out. We don't want behavior modification. We want a heart change, right? What does God look at? Our hearts Does he look at the external? No, that's what man looks at. Our God does not look at the external. He looks at the internal. That needs to drive our relationship with him. That truth needs to displace this nonsense that you have to look a certain way and be a certain body type and be a certain weight to be okay. That is a lie. Amen? Wow, that was weak. Okay, but I'll take it. God looks for the heart fully devoted to him, fully given over to him. That's what pleases him. That's why King David pleased him. His heart was fully devoted to the Lord. And he was a man after God's own heart. So let's pray, and then I'm going to turn this over, back over to the praise team. Would you bow your heads? Perhaps, Lord, taking our thoughts captive begins by being captivated by you. Capture us this day. Fill our minds with your presence. Holy Spirit, fill our minds with thoughts about the majesty and awesomeness of Jesus Christ. In fact, Holy Spirit, we pray for a fresh filling from you that you would come and fill our hearts, fill our lives with your presence and your power. Um, We just receive you. We believe in you and we receive you. Lord, in your name we rebuke, we stand against those lies that seek to destroy. Those big lies of culture that overemphasize looks and sexuality and sex and money and image and status and competition, Lord, and winning and losing. We, we just rebuke those things in, in your name. We break strongholds, Lord, that say we're doomed to be shackled to our sinfulness forever, that there's no way that we can ever change because your word says you give us a new mind and you renew us day by day and we're a new creation in you, Lord, and we stand fast in that truth. That truth will occupy our minds Lord, not the lie that we can never change. You love us. You transform us into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are the potter. We are the clay. You make beautiful things of our lives when we give them to you, Lord. Grace us, Jesus, to be thought warriors, to engage in the battle. The battle is afoot. Grace us, Lord, to be determined to be ones who participate in it and to be more than conquerors to you, Jesus, who give us your grace and strength in the person of the Holy Spirit. So we do battle in our minds, Lord. We declare we're going to do the battle in our minds and we're going to replace the lies with your truth. In your name we pray these things, Jesus. Amen.